what a lovely way to end the week, an audience with Andy Nairn. Uh, Andy is the co-founder of the creative agency Lucky Generals, uh, Campaign Magazine's top UK strategist for the last two years in a row. Well done, Andy. Um, author of a new book with a wonderful title, Go Look Yourself. Um, now, in this book, which we haven't read yet because it's not out for a little while, um, Andy argues that fortune plays a part in every success story um, and also every failure. So what he's going to do over the next 40 minutes or so is explain that what that means to those of us who are in the business of brand building. And then he's got 20 minutes to answer our questions. So Andy, over to you. Amazing, yeah. Well, <clears throat> hopefully this <clears throat> hopefully this talk will be more success than failure, but um <laughs> could be famous uh last words. Um uh yeah, I thought if it's okay by you, I would um I'll tell you a little bit about what uh what the book's about um and why I wrote it and then how you might be able to use it in your day jobs. Uh, so I'll start with the easy bit. Um the book is about the role of uh, luck in building a brand and I mean obviously one of the reasons I wrote it frankly is because I've got an agency called Lucky Gems. I mean I'd be, I'd be lying if I pretended that had not occurred uh, to me. I mean, I'm basically not going to uh, write a book called you know uncommon um, uh, advertising or you know the mother of all you know strategies or you know I mean, would you add them in either or anything like that even though they're amazing agencies brilliant people and all the rest of it no, it's just not going to happen for me so uh, yes there was that but Actually, I would say that I wrote this book about luck, despite having um, an agency with luck in its name. It just sort of occurred to me last year, um, in the middle of all this horrible stuff that's going on, that um, I didn't really know anything about luck. I didn't, I'd never given it much thought, to be honest. We never talk about it at Lucky Generals. And, uh, and yet, of course, last year, we all probably, I'm sure you're the same, found yourselves thinking quite a lot about luck. You know, I was, you know, a lot of the time thinking, like I'm sure you were, you know, how unlucky we all were to be in this sort of, you know, situation. And, but then on the other hand, I also found myself thinking about good luck and how fortunate actually I was because, um, you know, certainly from in my position, I'm like an old white male straight sort of dude um, who's insulated from a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the world over the last couple of years, you know. But I guess the point was that all these big stories, you know, whether it was Black Lives Matter or Me Too or the pandemic, sort of seem to revolve to some degree about luck and privilege and you know good fortune and things like that and I realized I didn't know anything about it and what was really weird actually was the more I sort of did a bit of research about it the more I realized that nobody like nobody talks about it we don't talk about it lucky gents but none of you I bet talk about luck um either I mean I bet I bet none of you um you know have ever applied to a job and just said yeah I'm really really lucky you know no, nobody puts it on the beginning of the can, you know, case study video. Yeah, we, this is a, just a massive fluke. Um, I, we, I found out that only 2% of business books even mention the word luck. So it's a bit of a taboo subject. And actually, I found out that it's, it's, it's actually worse than a taboo, isn't it? It's sort of, a, sort of an insult, isn't it? You know, if, if I were to call you lucky, you, you're probably gonna think I'm being pretty rude um, to you. So I quite like this um, idea of luck being, you know, luck is literally a four letter word, which is kind of where uh, I got the idea uh, for the book. Um, and now this is, um, this is the slightly cringy bit where, um, you know, like in a, in a chat show or something like that, where like the Graham Norton show, and you can sort of see it coming when they start talking, you know, gently about books and things like that. And then they realize, oh, hold on, I see what you're going to do here, you know, whip out a book. So yes, I am going to do that, but only, this is actually just a dummy copy because the, as, um, we were sort of saying it's not available actually until uh, June, although you can pre-order it now. Um, but I, I wrote that I came up with this title, and then uh, although I'm here to talk to you all about this, you know, the virtues of bravery and you know, creative courage and all the rest of it. Um, pathetically, I, I took ages to tell my mum uh, what this book was going to be called because I just she was so proud about our son writing this book. And um, I kept on avoiding, I kept on saying, what's it called? And I, I kept on sort of putting it off. And it, eventually it's, it's so bad this, I, I sort of said, um, I won't have any uh, say over that. That will actually be the publisher's call. So I really threw them under the bus and um, she hates 
my publisher. But um, anyway, the point is I started getting really interested in the idea of luck. I didn't know anything about it. And I discovered that there's two reasons why we don't talk about luck much in our sort of line of work or in business generally. Um, one of them is historic, um, is cultural. So, um, you know, uh, this is very much a Western hang up. You know, there's lots of cultures around the world and perhaps you um, have uh, connections with those cultures or you've worked in you know different parts of the world. And you'll, you'll know that uh, a lot of parts of the world are very comfortable talking about luck. Um, but in the in the West, we sort of think it's a bit superstitious and a bit primitive and we sort of look down our nose on it a bit. Um, so that's one reason. And then the other reason sort of connected to that is historical. So uh, what I discovered was that we were all very happy talking about luck, like everywhere else in the world, right up until the 1800s. And then the Victorians really turned on this idea of luck with a vengeance. And they hated it because it sort of contradicted their beliefs about you know, the Protestant work ethic and the Industrial Revolution. And basically, they believed that if you were successful, it was because you had, um, and rich, you'd, it's because you'd worked really hard and God had sort of smiled on you. And if you if you were poor and not successful, that pretty much meant that you just hadn't worked hard enough and you should try harder. And that sort of slightly, well, prejudiced um, point of view uh, I think still holds good in in, um, in Western society and is at the heart of a lot of our problems as a society and, and in particular um, in our business culture. Just work harder, slave away. The answer to everything is just like work harder and harder and harder. And um, I just don't buy it. Um, now, um, I am a big believer in hard work. I, I, I you know, hopefully um, that is something that I've always sort of um, believed in and um you know sort of lead um by example to others um i'm not here to say everyone take the uh you know just take the next few weeks off um and nor am i here to say yeah just uh sit back and wait for lucky things to happen to you um you know this isn't about superstition it's not about um stuff like this i, I got given a, a a rabbit's foot and I, it's a, not a real one i should emphasize um and um so it's not really about stuff like that although Actually, even stuff like this does tend to work. There's some science behind stuff like this that I can maybe explain later on. But the point of the book is not really about just waiting for lucky stuff to happen. It's about planning for luck and building it into your thinking and appreciating it. And like a lot of stuff in life, if you're mindful of something, if you really concentrate on it and are conscious of it, you're actually much more likely uh, to make it happen. And so that's the book. Um, in the book, there are uh, 40 chapters, 40 different ways, quite practical tips on how you can stack the odds in your brand's favour. And uh, don't worry, I'm not going to, um, <laughs> I'm not going to go through all 40 of those right now. Um, that would probably be very unlucky uh, for you. Uh, but I thought um, I might go through four different um, themes, four broad themes that are in the book. Um, and um, I might get you to write them down if that's all right, because I've not got any slides or I've sort of figured out that, um, probably you're all bored of PowerPoint slides by Zoom um, by now. So um, if you can write these down, it'll just help you keep track of where I'm meandering on this sort of uh, ramble. Uh, so the first one is um, to appreciate what you've got. Okay, so number one, appreciate what you've got. And the second one is look out for opportunities everywhere. And then number three is turn misfortune into good fortune. And then number four is practice being lucky. All right, everybody got that? Uh, I'm just gonna go through um, them uh, one at a time and then uh, we'll have a bit of a chat at the end. So um, this first one, appreciate what you got. I feel like that's the sort of thing we've probably all been thinking about over the last couple of years. Um, maybe from an individual point of view. So it's that thing I was talking about earlier, we're perhaps more conscious of our privilege and appreciating you know, the position that we're in. And certainly that's, that has, as I, say, as I say, been something for me. Um, I'm given all the royalties, by the way, for this book uh, to a really good cause called Commercial Break that help working class kids uh, get a break into our industry. So I think as individuals, we know that we should appreciate what we've got. But I, I think the same is true for brands. And the sort of analogy I use is from the world of um, antiques. And um, I, I don't know if any of you know anything about antiques. I, I, I don't, but um, I, I love these stories, like on Antique Roadshow and stuff like that, where um, people are 
we find out that people are using like priceless antiques in really dumb ways, like they don't realize how amazing they are. They're like using something for an umbrella stand or something like that. So there was somebody recently on Antique Georgia that had a little glass um, jar, um, a bit like this, except sadly not this, because this cost me three pounds and hers, which she was using to store crisps in, um, went for 30,000 pounds. So pretty good. And there's loads of examples of this. When I look at, um, there was a family from um, Cornwall, I think, who um, had a sort of, they're cleaning out the garage a bit, it was messy shelves like this. I'm sure we've all got cupboards and rooms like this or garages like this was full of crap. Um, they found, they were chucking a whole bunch of toys out that their kids who were now growing up um, didn't need anymore. And they were about to chuck this out and it was some old Star Wars memorabilia. Again, sadly not this one, because this cost me a couple of quid. Theirs went for £300,000 for some old Star Wars sort of tat. Um, and then my favourite one is there's a, there's a guy in California who um, had, he was down and out. So it was, uh, it was a quite a sad story. He was um, living just with his cat. He, was, he didn't have any possessions apart from this old filthy old blanket that he'd wrapped his cat up in. And somebody spotted that it was a, a Navajo, very rare Navajo blanket, and he ended up selling it for $1.5 million to totally turn his life around. Um, and what I love about these stories, so we sort of kind of laugh at them because they're, wow, these people are a bit silly, didn't realize how, how incredibly um, you know, valuable the treasures were that they were sitting on, and they were sort of a bit oblivious to them. Um, but actually, I think, in our industry, quite often we're guilty of a far bigger sort of, um, you know, crimes or emissions. You know, we we don't realise that we might be sitting on things that are worth uh, not just tens of thousands or ten or hundreds of thousands even, but tens of millions or even like hundreds of millions. And I think one of our jobs as agencies, those of you here who are you know, in agencies of any sort, or within client companies, is to to help organisations. Um, appreciate what they've already got, like what is in their corporate attic, what is in the sort of the old, you know, the company garden shed, if you like, that they, they've maybe forgotten about and they just need to bring back out, blow the dust off and realise how precious, precious it is. Um, so, for instance, um, a lot of companies, um, perhaps you've worked on some that are like this, they don't realise how powerful the brand's history can be. Like history can be a really interesting thing a lot of times companies don't want to think about their history because they they think that's backwards looking whereas actually sometimes knowing about your heritage can be a really good way to find out where you should be going in the future so you know it might be heritage or it might be provenance you know a lot of the time companies don't really appreciate the place that they're from because they might worry about you know nobody's going to be interested in that whereas you know it's that classic thing where we don't really care about or we don't appreciate the place that we are born um, and often it takes someone from out of town to say, wow, wow, this place is where you come from. Then you should tell everyone about that. It's amazing. Um, but we're, we're just used to it. It's just the place we got brought up. Um, and that's the same for companies. Uh, or it might be data. You know, they might be sitting on a huge pile of data that they just don't know what to do with. Uh, or they might have like an amazing medium. You know, a lot of the time, you know, we find ourselves talking to companies and wow, you've got this, this packaging is like incredible real estate for a message it's not just you know for packaging details um or you know your shop windows is like a 48 sheet poster you know the, having a, your own medium uh, is something that often you know companies don't sort of appreciate or it could be what else things like names you know a lot of the time we don't think about our own name companies don't really think about their own name and sometimes the answer is in the name itself that can hold a lot of uh, clues or there might be a brand character that they've just never thought about or they, they think it's a bit old hat and a bit naff. Uh, you get the picture. A lot of the time, organisations are sitting things, the answer is right under the nose. And here's an example um, that you'll be familiar with. is this um, this little company that we happen to work for. Um, uh, and this is the Amazon, uh, what is, has traditionally been called the Amazon Arrow that goes from A to Z as something that um, you know signifies that they sell everything from A to Z. And they can also get you everything from A to Z. So it's a sort of a logistics kind of um, device. But actually, if you look at it in another way, 
it can also be a smile. And actually, if you go back to the original blueprints um, the designed by the original design agency, they, they did intend it to have a bit of a duality there, but everyone has sort of forgotten about this um, over the years, over the 20 years that this thing's been around, um, and it was known as the arrow. And we sort of thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have it as a smile? And if it's a smile, then the boxes can sing. And, and that's what we've been doing for Amazon for the last three or four years. We've been having singing boxes and delivering smiles all over the world, not just delivering cardboard boxes all over the world. And they've done lots and lots of things with that device around their business. And how much is that worth um, to an organization like Amazon? It's worth quite a lot. So um, my first sort of section, my first theme, first thing I always try and do with companies is to just sit down and appreciate what you've got. And um, as I say, there's lots of practical tips for that in the book, but for now, I wanna just sort of leave you with a thought from another book, which is, uh, I've got really highbrow references, by the way, in my book. This is like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And um, uh, the, uh, there's a lovely quote in this from Roald Dahl, where he says, uh, we are all of us a great deal luckier than we think. And I just think that's a really nice sort of quote um, and a nice way to approach a brief. You know, sometimes it doesn't look like an organization's got much in its locker room, but usually there is something just lurking there. Um, you just have to go through all the different sort of uh, things that might be there and see if you can make more of the things that you've already got. It's quite a good starting point. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then the second sort of um, area is um, looking out for opportunities everywhere. And there's a, there's a great, um, a great uh, psychologist called Richard Wiseman, um, which is quite a nice bit of nominative determinism. I think it's like a really wise man who's, who's called Richard Wiseman. And he has got, um, he's an expert in the psychology of luck. And he does an experiment where he uh, recruits people and asks them um, to self-identify. Are you, are you generally a sort of a lucky kind of person or an unlucky kind of person? And then he gets them to uh, read a newspaper and uh, count the number of photographs in the newspaper. Um, and uh, what happens is amazing. And the people who are identified as lucky tend to do the task in a couple of seconds. And the people who say that they're unlucky tend to take a couple of minutes. And the reason is that on page two of the newspaper, he puts a little um, notice saying, um, yeah, you can stop counting now. There's actually 42 photographs in this newspaper. Um, you know, just tell the researchers uh, and you can take your money and go home. And what he says is that it, it's interesting that when we say someone is lucky, uh, a lot of the time, all we really mean is that, um, you know, we're, we're the sort of person that, you know, has our eyes open and spots opportunities that are around us. Um, whereas if we're unlucky, a lot of the time, it's not that they, we don't have the same opportunities, it's because our heads are down and we're concentrating on the task at hand so like in this case, um, counting photographs, and we don't spot all the other things that are going on that are not quite on task, um, but could still be really interesting to us. Now, I think that's like really um, true and relevant to our industry, um, especially at the moment, um, because um, at the moment, you know, I think I guess a lot of us have got our heads down and we're sort of, um, you know, we're concentrating on the task at hand, aren't we? Um, so, uh, you know, we need to sort of keep our eyes open and look out and about and sort of see uh, all the other things that are going on in, in life. Um, and I think that the, one of the um, spheres of life that where people are really good at that is science. Like if you look at um, all the great scientific discoveries, or lots of them anyway, you know, they come from happy accidents, don't they? They're lucky things where people are not just so focused that they miss out all these other things. Um, you know, the classic one is um, Alexander Fleming, who was doing his experiment, and out the corner of his eye, he sees on the windowsill um, a Petri dish, uh, which was covered in, in mould, wasn't it? And that, like, I, and perhaps you, would, I'd be disgusted by, like, the horrible, I would have just chucked that away, um, and that would have been the end of that discovery. But, of course, what Alexander Fleming did was he realised that that had some application to some other work that he was doing and he was able to transfer that knowledge and he realized that that was a thing that was going to help him sort of eventually uh, create um, penicillin. So there's a sort of, yes, there was a sort of a bit of luck to that, but there was also some smart application of that thinking. That, that is true in so many scientific discoveries, you know, there's tons, um, you know, another one is v Viagra, 
where, where they were doing some research, um, I think on cardiac drugs, and the researchers uh, realized there was a sort of a quite an unusual um, uh, side effect amongst the male um, respondents. Um, so we, we salute all of that sort of, um, those sort of breakthroughs in the world of science, because um, we realize they're not just pure flukes, they, there's a sort of a skill to taking the lucky opportunity and doing something with it. Uh, but in our world, I think we sort of, we really look down at that sort of thing. So we, we think that's post-rationalization. And if you just discover an idea, if you stumble on it, um, when you're doing another, working on another brief and you, you know, something pops into your head, that's, that's like look down on because you've just post-rationalized it. You know, we're supposed to think very logically through the problem, uh, you know, the business problem, the brand, the creative idea and so on. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, I find that it doesn't always happen that way and we shouldn't pretend that it always happens that way. Sometimes I think the best ideas you know, come from all over. They come from, uh, you know, it could be from sport or religion or music or fashion or psychology or politics or um, uh, any of these other sort of, you know, art, uh, nature. Uh, and I think the more we can sort of um, surround ourselves with other things beyond just the core task that we are sort of supposed to be working on, um, the more likely it is that we're going to have these happy accidents where we bump into an idea that we weren't expecting uh, that turns out to be um, brilliant, even though that wasn't on our sort of plan in the first place. And um, so again, so my sort of second theme is, a, is about that kind of thing. And one of, the, one of the ways actually that we can all increase that chance of um, those lucky collisions is, is sort of just by having a diverse team. And obviously, we rightly talk a lot about diversity right now from an ethical point of view. It's just the right thing to do, isn't it? But um, there's also like a really strong creative argument. And I'm going to get you to, if you can, help me with a little experiment. It might be quite hard in this format to see because I can't, I can't see you right now. Um, but you might have to, you might have to do this a little bit on chat. But um, I'd like it if you could draw me something or draw something for yourself. Draw a, if you can imagine a, a planet that is very, very different from ours and far, far away. And if you could draw me an alien. Um, so what would this little alien look like on this far away planet? If you just give yourself sort of 10, 15 seconds uh, to do that, and then we'll figure out a way to, um, uh, to find out what you've done. All right? No, I don't know if anyone's ready yet. It's hard for me to tell, but um, uh, I'm going to guess that uh, virtually all of you have probably drawn something that looks pretty identical. If you could, if you were able to all hold them up, we would probably see that everyone's done very similar drawings here. And in particular, I'm going to bet that virtually all of you have put, um, uh, have given your little aliens some form of kind of sense organs, so either eyes or mouth or nose or ears or antennae or something like that. Um, I'm also going to bet that I bet most of you have um, have, have given your uh, creatures sort of uh, legs or arms uh, or sort of limbs or you know tentacles of some sort. Am I right in thinking that? See if anyone's seeing that on the on the chat. Um, almost certainly. Um, and I'm also going to guess that weirdly, I'm sure lots of you have drawn things that are roughly symmetrical, because that tends to be the way we draw things. Yeah. So two eyes and a large nose and smiley face uh, on mine, and that is going to be the same for a lot of you, I think. So the point the point is that um, uh, there's, there's a university uh, called Texas A&M University um, who's done this hundreds of times, and everyone does this. So I'm going to be amazed if you are any different. And the reason that we all respond that way is because like, the human brain just can't um, imagine something entirely out of our experience. Like, we can't just, um, you know, we've all grown up on the same planet and this, well, unless there's something really weird going on here. Um, we've all, we're all familiar with the same sort of animals and with the same sort of cultural expectation of what an alien is, because we've seen the same sort of sci-fi movies. Um, so it's sort of impossible for us to think, especially when we're put on the spot, 
of anything else. And the, the point that they would then make is, um, the more serious point is that because that's the way that the human brain works, if we construct teams of people who are all from the same planet, if you like, um, then we're all going to come up with the same answers like we just did then. Um, and it's all going to, you know, at least a very similar kind of idea. And what we all obviously need to do is have people from different planets or different backgrounds, different cultures, um, and that will massively increase our odds of coming up with something fresh and new and creative, which is obviously what we all want to do. So the point is, um, we can increase our luck by having diverse teams. It's, it is an ethical question, but it's also just like a massive creative advantage um, to do things that way. Okay. So that is the second uh, sort of theme. And then the third bit, third thing I want to talk about is um, turning misfortune into uh, good fortune. So um, does anyone know, uh, again, I, probably, I can't really tell this, I'm not really uh, thought this through, but um, this little chap here, I'm going to be amazed if anyone knows. Uh, put it in the chat if you, if you do know, but I I'm going to be extremely surprised. Um, this is a little character uh, called uh, Oswald, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And he was the first um, big hit for Walt Disney. So Walt Disney made a load of money with, on him in, in 1928. Um, and he was getting signed up to make another 25 movies by Universal Studios. Um, and so he went up to New York to sign this deal um, full of excitement. And when he was in New York, over the space of a couple of days, his, his partner basically ripped him off, took the intellectual property of the rabbit with him, um, and then um, also took lots of Walt Disney's people. So Walt Disney was absolutely gutted. He was left with nothing. And he's sitting on um, a train coming back from New York to Los Angeles and pretty much about to give up. He was so sort of despondent. Um, but because he was uh, Walt Disney, um, and because I suppose it's a long, long train journey, isn't it, from uh, uh, New York to LA? He sat looking out the window, absolutely gutted and despondent, but but doodling because he that's what he does, and he's doodling away, doodle, doodle, doodle. And by the time he got out in Los Angeles, he had come up with something a bit more like this, um, probably a lot better drawn than this. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made his fortune. But the point is, he came up with Mickey Mouse, and he would look back and sort of say, um, actually, the luckiest thing about Oswald the Lucky Rabbit uh, was that he never happened and that somebody stole him away because otherwise it would have never come up with Mickey Mouse. And I, I love that story because it's about resilience, isn't it? So you're right, it does look like Mickey Mouse. There's a sort of a shared DNA um, there. Um, I love it because it's about resilience. We're in a business where we're always coming up with you know ideas. A lot of the time they get taken away from us. They die in research, clients change their mind, You know, the media budget's cut or whatever. And we have to go again and not actually just go again to do something that's kind of half as good, but come up with something that's twice as good, like Walt did. And um, I think what I've sort of learned over the years, and maybe you're the same, is that the very best companies um, don't just sort of cope with good uh, with bad luck. I mean, that's what good companies do, but the very, very best ones almost like run towards the bad luck. They can kind of tell that actually by confronting something that looks like misfortune, they can turn it into good fortune. So the example I would use is somebody like um, Steve Jobs uh, deliberately used to kill off his own products because he believed if he didn't kill them off, then, then somebody else would. Uh, so he, um, he, he, yeah, he would um, kill off all the various sort of things that um, were, you know, his you know, iPods and iPads and phones and all the rest. He's always thinking of what is the next thing um, to come down the line. Um, or when I think about, you know, the great, you know, advertising people like um, Burn back, um, back in the 50s, where he was, uh, you know, developing ideas for Volkswagen, he, what he would often do is start with the, the, a negative, like start with a flaw, like the fact that Volkswagens were small, and he would turn that into a good thing, or the fact that Avis were number two in the market, but that's all right, because we can try harder. So he knew that if you can turn a negative on its head, that's actually impressive to people, because people like People, we like it when somebody admits to having a little bit of a flaw. We don't particularly like it when, you know, companies say that they're absolutely um, perfect. Um, and when I look at, you know, brands like at the moment, like um, Bodyform and Libres, I love that campaign where they've taken a taboo. I mean, a taboo is like about the worst thing of all, right? It's like, a, that's the worst luck because nobody wants to talk to you 
about your product or your category. That's terrible luck in conventional marketing terms. And but no, they've kind of ran right towards us and said, "Yeah, we don't care if nobody talks about it. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna celebrate it. We're gonna double down on it and make it an amazing, beautiful um, ode to all things, you know, you know, feminine." And, and we're going to talk about menstruation, we're going to talk about the womb, and we're going to say viva la vulva, and it's amazing and beautiful, and, um, you know, they, they, they embrace what conventional marketing would have said, oh, don't go near there, that's a, that's a difficult sort of territory. I think that's often the case. I think sometimes when there's a constraint, you know, sometimes not having money can be a good thing, sometimes not having time can turn out to be your saviour, um, you know, a deadline can force you to do something. Um, and I, I sort of just generally think that one of one of my top tips when I'm working on a brief is to look for all the negative things. You know, our tendency is to start, you know, we write down all the all the good things about this brand or product, but actually it can be more powerful to find out what are the what are the flaws, what are the bad things, what are the things that people don't like about it. I, one of the things I always do is try and find out what are the jokes that people make about it, because people, you know, there's often a bit of truth in, in humour, isn't there? And the mean things that people say on social media can actually sometimes turn out to be quite interesting. A flip and turn on their head and sort of see if you can actually um, make something good out of them. And so that'd be my third theme is don't be afraid of bad luck. Actually, bad luck can be a, an amazing way, an amazing thing to convert into, into good luck. And then the fourth and final sort of uh, theme is about um, practicing uh, being lucky. Which you might think is a bit of an oxymoron, um, you know. It sort of sounds like um, a spontaneous, you know, planned spontaneity or something like that. But um, what I mean is that um, yes, you you know you can work hard, but you can also you need to leave a little bit of room and then plan for this luck to happen, and you can create a bit of space um, for it. And I think that the world of music is a good um, a good analogy for this. So um, the the best record producer in the world of all time is Quincy Jones. And some of you will know he's he sold about 600 million records, uh, including the best selling album of all time, which is Thriller with Michael Jackson. And he worked so hard on that record that the speakers caught fire. So it's, like I say, it's, this isn't about, you know, don't work hard, you have to work hard. But we also did, he used to carve out a bit of space on the schedule and in his own mind, uh, for just cool, unexpected things to happen that he hadn't predicted, but it would happen on the day or through the creative process. And he summed that up as saying, let the Lord walk through the room. I love that phrase. Um, he used to put it on it, in fact, I think he's still got it, on his recording studio wall, just those letters, those words, let the Lord walk through the room. And I love that because a lot of the time, I feel like in our industry, we're trying to keep the Lord locked out of the room. You know, we try to predict everything to the most minute detail and degree that we forget that it's nice to have a bit of lucky accidents and, you know, serendipity on the day. And when I, when I look at other great musicians, you know, they, they often factor in and deliberately, that's what I mean, this mindful, deliberate cultivation of luck. And um, uh, so if I think about David Bowie, um, or Bowie, he used to, do you know how he used to write songs? He used to sort of get a newspaper and cut uh cut chunks of the newspaper up chuck it all in the air and when it landed it would make unusual patterns like unusual combinations of words so you go oh diamonds and dogs diamond dogs okay that's a that's gonna be my new album diamond dogs um or tom waits if anybody's into tom waits he uh, he puts two radios on at the same time and he listens for unusual you know different stations so he might listen to that genre and that genre they don't go together but that that Kind of makes them unusual or those lyrics and that lyric that creates an unusual clash or new combination that's never been heard before so he's forcing creativity he's kind of deliberately trying to make happy accidents happen um or the most famous band of all time the beatles they used to do that a lot as well um so i don't know if any of you know the story behind the most it's the most covered song of all time this this is um this thing which is uh yesterday by the Beatles and um, it's been covered seven million times which I just find absolutely mind-boggling um, so by all the greats you know people like um, Sinatra, uh, Elvis Presley, uh, Daffy Duck as well uh, anyway it's been covered an awful lot and but it began very humbly 
um, as a dream. So Paul McCartney dreamt this melody one night, woke up the next day, desperate not to forget this um, melody. So he's sort of looking around thinking, ah, I need some something to anchor this um, tune with some words. And he was on tour, so the first thing that he could see was uh, somebody making breakfast. So he started singing, um, uh, scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs, but not as much as scrambled eggs. So absolutely terrible lyric, but it helped him to keep that tune in his head. And for the next couple of months, that's all it was. He used to drive the Beatles nuts by singing this scrambled egg song. Um, but it got him started. And um, you know, sometimes that's what you need. You need a lucky start to just get you get yourself going. And then you can apply some of the more you know, conventional strategic rigor, or in his case, sort of songwriting rigor. And, and obviously, he eventually made it into something much more profound. Um, but I like that addition of luck and random chance elements to create something new. And I thought I might, we might finish off by um, trying a little bit of that. Again, I don't know if this format's gonna quite work, but I wonder whether if you could suggest some categories or sectors um, in the chat function, um, and then somebody might need to sort of adjudicate and choose one for me, but if we were having to improvise and think of some strategies for uh, a particular brand, only using the lyrics of yesterday, um, I'm going to give it a try. So this might be a nightmare, but let's see. Anybody want to suggest anything? Gardening equipment. I, I, oh my God, that's that. Please someone suggest something else. I don't have to do that. Suppositories. I see what sort of crowd we've got in today. Some filthy minded people. And what yeah, are we going to do? I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh... I'm going to ask you to do, it's already been mentioned once, uh, Viagra. Start with that. Seriously? Oh my God. All right. Okay. Now, okay. This, this could cause me all, all sorts of problems, but this may be where my career goes down the tubes. Good and proper, this one. Right. Okay. Um, okay. No judging. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of water. So I go la 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 la. Right. Um, Right, so Viagra coming in in 10 minutes and um, the, we, we need sort of 15 different strategies or whatever to sort of um, uh, to, to just start the process with them. So um, let's, let's think so. Uh, yesterday, uh, okay, that's a heritage strategy, isn't it? So that's like how long have you, you know, how long have Viagra been doing this? Been doing this quite a long time now. So that's, that's pretty reassuring. Um, all my troubles seem so far away. Yeah, of course. And what they do is take your troubles away. So it could be a whole strategy about problem solution. That's um, sort of functional. Um, now it looks as if they're here to stay. That's all about endurance and longer lasting effects of Viagra. I can't believe I'm saying this now, but there's a sort of a, a durability. How long does the product last for sort of thing? Um, oh, I believe in yesterday. That's your brand manifesto sort of strategy. So what do Viagra believe in? these days okay suddenly <clears throat> god suddenly that that's probably got all sorts of horrible connotations in this particular um category but you know maybe it's about impulse maybe impulse purchasing of viagra um you know because it allows you allows you to live more spontaneously um i'm not half the man i used to be them I mean, that that one actually fits perfectly with viagra so that might be all about um our views of ourselves as men and um, you know, whether Viagra can help us feel like we are the men that we used to be. Um, there's a shadow hanging over me. That could be all about, remember that taboo thing that we talked about and the shadow of masculinity that we're worried about. And maybe we should run all the way through um, to this and sort of embrace um, this shadow, this, this fear that we have um, uh, for Viagra. Um, why she had to go, I don't know. She wouldn't say, my goodness, these lyrics are sounding so perfect now but um maybe that's all about um our worries about um you know what women might feel about this and um their their views that might be quite an interesting targeting strategy and uh, that we target viagra at uh, women um i said something wrong so that that something wrong could be a, about taboos again or misinformation maybe it's about sort of things that misguided information that people have about viagra there's probably a lot of that around isn't there um, which they could correct. So that's perhaps a correcting sort of myth-busting strategy. Now, I long for yesterday. 
longing that's like quite a common strategy like it's the got milk sort of strategy that you know when you're longing and you know desiring obviously in this category that could be quite an interesting take right uh, last verse yesterday love was such an easy game to play so obviously love so maybe we make it more about love than sex that's a strategy there um easiness it's all about how convenient it is and game to play maybe we make it more playful maybe this brand has got kind of a serious connotation um, and maybe we go with the jokes that make, people make about Viagra and, and we play around with that a little bit. Uh, now I need a place to hide away. Uh, do you know what? Maybe that's about shame and the, the idea that we, we, we want to hide away and that this brand is sort of uh, slightly shameful and do we have to confront that on its head? And then finally, we have the immortal lyrics um, that I'm sure took Paul McCartney uh, you know, months to write, where he finishes the song by saying, mm, mm, mm. Mm, 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 mm. which I guess in this context is the enjoyment um, strategy. It's all about how enjoyable the effects of this product are going to be when you use it. Um, and okay, I'm being an, an idiot now, and that was a particularly horrendous choice to give me, but hopefully I've sort of proved the point um, that certainly at the beginning of the process, a random element like that, can, can actually liberate your mind and help you generate lots and lots of ideas that of course, some of them are gonna be rubbish, um, but some of them actually might be half okay once you go back to them with a more sort of rigorous um, uh, sort of approach and you filter them out and you might end up with a, you know half a dozen that are, that are half decent. Um, my point is that I think luck is a good thing in life. Um, you know, generally to be lucky should be smiled upon as a, as a nice and positive thing. So why do we spend so much of our time trying to eradicate it? You know, we say, let's leave nothing to luck. Let's leave nothing to chance. Uh, let's not allow luck into the situation. Whereas actually we should be trying to encourage it and facilitate it and carve out a little space. And let the Lord walk through the room. And I think it also makes life and work life a little bit more fun if we do that as well. Um, so I, I'm here to say let's have a bit more luck at a time when probably all of us could do with a bit more luck. So go luck yourself.